In this video, I'm gonna answer viewers' questions about multiple sclerosis. Don't turn away, because that starts right now. Hey! Howdy. Thanks for learning about MS with me, Aaron Boster. I'm the founder of the Boster Center for Multiple Sclerosis, where we care for families impacted by MS from around the globe. I love answering your YouTube questions, and I've really enjoyed a few impromptu Ask Me Anything live chats right here on YouTube. I love fielding your questions, but unfortunately, I didn't get to answer all of them. So in this video, I'm going to be answering those questions. Let's jump in. Sarah asks, can you see lesions without contrast on the MRI? And the answer, Sarah, is yes, you can but you can't see everything about them. Let me explain. When you go in the MRI scanner and it makes different noises, bang, 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 bing, 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 what it's doing is taking different kinds of pictures. And each one of those kinds of pictures shows you different kinds of information. Now, when the technician pulls you out of the scanner gantry and injects your arm with the contrast agent, the dye, then they put you back in the scanner and then there's more noises, bang, 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 those pictures are post-contrast images. It's after the administration of the contrast dye. And if there is a brand new lesion, new within the last couple weeks, it'll light up, it'll enhance. Now, if you don't administer contrast and you get all the rest of the MRI sequences, there's still a tremendous amount that you can learn. It's still very useful, but you lose that piece of information. So can you still see lesions? Most of the time, yes you just lose some of the information about them. Spill the Tea writes, I have gained a lot of weight since I got sick. I'm about to have a gastric bypass. In what way might this affect my MS? Spill the Tea, thank you for the question. This has been studied and people impacted by MS can have a gastric bypass safely, just like the general population. And it's one of the very best ways for a person with MS to lose a significant amount of weight. I think it's a really helpful tool. I also want to make sure that the person with MS that's exploring a gastric bypass understands it's not a fix-all. And it's something that's very valuable along with behavioral changes and diet and lifestyle changes and all those other kind of things. I'd love to hear how things go. Best of luck. Lucy writes in, I love these videos. I like to ask why neurologists just do brain MRI regularly and not spinal cord MRIs also. Could I have a stable brain MRI and still have new lesions on the spinal cord? Or is the likelihood really low? Lucy, that's a great question. Now the consortium of MS centers suggests that there's brain and spine a diagnosis. And I certainly agree with that. And I actually feel it's a best practice at the time of working someone up for diagnosis to get brain, cervical, and thoracic cord MRI. I wanna get a full capture of the central compartment. Then for surveillance, it's recommended to get a brain MRI once a year. And I very much agree with that, at least up until the age of 60. I think it's a best practice to get an MRI of the brain once a year. Now the consortium suggests that we don't get a C-spine or T-spine MRI unless the human being has symptoms which localize to those areas. And the reason is what you bring up. It's way less likely to have a new lesion there and not manifest a symptom. That stated, I personally like to get at least a C-spine every couple of years because in my experience, there can be asymptomatic lesions. It's not common, but it can occur. So in my mind, if we are examining the person and doing neurological testing a couple times a year, if we are carefully listening to them several times a year, both in clinic and through patient reported outcome measures, and if we're getting an MRI of the brain once a year and an MRI of at least the cervical spine every couple of years, that's a pretty good surveillance program. Great question, thank you for asking. Question, can MS lead to psoriasis, my new condition? So psoriasis is an autoimmune condition that affects the skin. And MS is an autoimmune condition that affects the brain and spinal cord. And it turns out that if a human being has one autoimmune condition, they are at higher risk of having a second autoimmune condition. Also, by the way, if a human being has an autoimmune condition, members of their family are also likely to have an autoimmune condition. It doesn't need to be the same one. So there are patients that have both multiple sclerosis and psoriasis. Now, in treatment for MS, we're always looking for twofers, where we can kill two birds with one stone. And this is a situation where sometimes we can do that. It turns out that one of uh, the classes of MS medicines, the fumarates, 
So this is medicines like Tecfidera and Vumeridae. They treat MS, but they also treat psoriasis. And so sometimes patients that have both conditions can benefit from being on the one drug and they can have control of both autoimmune conditions. Best of luck to you and thank you for bringing that up. Ezra writes, hi, I'm 33 years old. Just found out recently that I have MS. I also struggle with depression. How common is it for depression to be affected by MS? Is there a causal connection? Ezra, thanks for feeling comfortable writing in and you are not alone. In fact, having multiple sclerosis results in doubling the likelihood that that individual will experience depression or anxiety at some point in their life, double compared to the general population. Now that's a really, really high likelihood. And in my practice, taking care of people impacted by MS, I see depression very, very commonly, and I treat it very commonly. So is there a causal connection? Probably. It's my belief that the imbalance of the neurotransmitters and the inflammatory milieu in the brain is probably a setup to experience depression. And there are some studies that show there are damage to certain portions of the frontal lobes in people with MS where we see an increased risk of depression, suggesting a causal connection there. I also think the nature of MS, the not knowing what's coming down the pipeline and if you may uh, have an attack, that state creates an increased risk of depression as well. I do wanna share with you that depression is readily treatable and I hope that you're open to talking with your provider because we could treat your depression. Last comment is that people impacted by MS who have untreated depression are found to have a faster progression of disease compared to those that don't. So there's several really, really good reasons to treat depression. Thanks for the question. Jason Bell writes in, in the US, how did we go from 400,000 to 1 million plus people with MS? Do you think that's real? Jason, I do think it's real. And let me share with you sort of the backstory. So the last time there was a giant census looking at the number of people impacted by MS in the US was in the early 1980s. And it wasn't updated at any point during the 90s or the 2000s, it wasn't really updated until about 2018 or 2019. And when we looked, we were shocked because the updated numbers were over 900,000, so very close to a million. I don't think that the risk suddenly doubled. I think that we never recounted. I think since the 80s, there's been an increase in number of cases of MS around the world. That's actually been studied but in addition, I think there's a better understanding of MS, and so we are better at diagnosing it. So I do, in fact, think that number is real. All things told, probably that 400,000 number was an underrepresentation back then. MS is not that rare. And here in Ohio, where I practice, we estimate that the incidence is about 1 in 350. That's not that uncommon. Taylor asks, hello from Australia. Question about Tysabri. How do you feel about people going from the recommended every four weeks to every five to six weeks, even if they're JC virus antibody negative? So this is a great question. Tysabri is a highly effective MS medicine. It's an infusion given in the vein. And per the FDA label and the recommended dosing, it's given once every 28 days. So once every four weeks, let's say. Now, there's been some studies done by some really good MS neurologists with lots and lots of patients on Tysabri looking at what happens if you give it longer. Now, giving Tysabri every 12 weeks is a really bad idea. People have breakthrough disease and rebound, and it's scary. Giving Tysabri every eight weeks is on the cusp of being too long. And some patients, if you give them uh, Tysabri every eight weeks, after a couple rounds, it kind of wears off and they can have breakthrough disease. But it turns out that giving Tysabri every five to six weeks doesn't seem to unbind receptors and doesn't change the risk of attacks or change the efficacy of the drug, at least based on the investigations that have been done. Now, what's also very interesting is in one study, what we found was the patients on Tysabri every four weeks did experience a few cases of PML, unfortunately. But in the investigations, none of the patients that were on every five to six week Tysabri got PML. And that's very interesting, and maybe it suggests that going on Tysabri every five to six weeks actually reduces the risk of PML. So what do I think about someone doing that? I don't have a problem with it. If I'm picking and they're JC virus negative, I think at least in the beginning, I like to go every four weeks because that's where most of the data is. It's the easiest for me to apply that situation to the data sets that I'm aware of. But 
If the person would like to go every five or six weeks, either because they're traveling from a significant distance or what have you, I'm not opposed to it because I don't think that it probably decreases the efficacy. Great question. Thanks for asking. Sybil asks, does physical therapy help muscle spasticity? Yes. So muscle spasticity is common in MS. Maybe upwards of 70% of people with MS have it and about 30 to 40% is severe. Spasticity is a situation where two opposing muscles are not playing nicely together. And so when one muscle is trying to contract, the other muscle is trying at the same time and you're having a tug of war. And that can manifest in three ways. You can have spasms or limbs that'll bounce. You can have a stiff limb that's hard to bend or you can have a cramp like a charley horse. And spasticity is worsened when you are still. So when you're not moving much. Physical therapy is the opposite of being still. In physical therapy, they will stretch and they will strengthen and they will help move the muscles in the appropriate ranges of motion and through the appropriate mechanics. So I find physical therapy to be a very, very powerful tool in treating spasticity. Stephanie Maxwell writes in, Good morning, Doc. I would like to know what's your take on HSCT. I was really thinking about getting that procedure done, but I don't want the chemo that goes along with it. Stephanie, good morning to you and thank you for bringing up this point. Now, when you assess any treatment or therapy or medication, you have to consider the risk of the therapy or procedure or medicine and the benefit that you may get, the risk benefit. And this is very, very important. Now, what I hear in your question is that the idea of the potential benefit from stem cell transplantation is attractive, which I agree on. I also hear that you're uncomfortable receiving the chemo necessary to make it work. And to me, this suggests this is not a good fit for you because the reality is the chemo is just one of the many, many risks that we see in the setting of stem cell transplantation. And if you're feeling uncomfortable, that is completely appropriate. But to, to my ears, that's a tip off that we need to talk about other options also. Just my two cents. Shadow Blights writes, hello, Dr. Boster. There's a great deal of issues I'm currently facing. Most terrifyingly, struggling with swallowing in my health. So shadow blights, you bring up a super, super important reminder. And I'm gonna be very, very blunt here. There are three ways that people with MS can leave this world, from complications that is. The first is from what we call an aspiration pneumonia, where you swallow and it goes down the wrong tube. It goes into your lungs and causes an infection, causes an aspiration pneumonia. And if you're noticing that you're having difficulty swallowing with MS, that is not something to blow off. You want to bring that to the attention of your provider right away. You wanna work with a speech pathologist. You may need swallow studies. And there are things we can do to make sure that we stay safe so that you're not putting yourself at risk of an aspiration pneumonia. I also hope that other people listening to this who are impacted by MS will keep in mind that if they're having coughing, sputtering, uh, choking, gasping while eating or drinking, not to blow that off and to bring it to the attention of their provider. Caesar asks, do you recommend Fampira? So Fampira, or in the United States, Ampira, the generic name is for aminopyridine, is a symptomatic medicine for heat sensitivity and multiple sclerosis. It's not a disease modifying therapy that slows down the disease or decreases attacks, but it treats a really nasty symptom. When there's been damage to the brain or spinal cord or optic nerves from MS, and that damage has healed somewhat, it becomes really sensitive to when your body gets overheated. And when your body gets overheated, that area of damage can literally short circuit. So someone who had an optic neuritis in the past and it got better and they can see again, when they get overheated going outside in Ohio in August and their core body temperature is raised, they again go blind. Fortunately, when their body cools back down, they can see again. This is a heat sensitive phenomenon, but it's a really, really bothersome one. And for patients who respond to Empira, it buttresses against that. Literally on Empira, that same person could go out in the August heat in Ohio and they don't go blind. Now it turns out that Empira seems to work on any heat sensitive symptom. We tested uh, this drug and I was involved in the clinical trials way back then. We tested it in, to see if it could increase walking speed. Why? I think because that's a really easy thing to test. 
But what I have found in clinical practice is that for patients who respond to Empira, any heat-sensitive symptom can improve. So I gave the example of heat-sensitive loss of vision in the background of old optic neuritis. I've seen heat-sensitive erectile dysfunction improve by Empira. There are, of course, some side effects and things we need to think about. First of all, Empira is not a good drug for patients that have a seizure history because it could increase the risk of seizures. Second of all, it's processed by the kidneys, and so we have to make sure that you have okay kidney function. Rarely, Empiric can cause unsteadiness of walking or upset stomach, and rarely, Empiric can cause insomnia. And so we have to be aware of all that when we try to use it. I typically find that if I give a patient Empiric for a month, at the end of the month, they'll give me a very clear answer if they think it's worked. They'll either say, wow, this is amazing. I went out in the heat and I was able to keep doing X or keep doing Y. Or they'll say, I don't really know. And if they say, I don't really know, then generally speaking, we don't think that it worked. Let's take for a second, though, patients that don't respond to Empira. So someone with MS who is heat sensitive and they try Empira and it doesn't help them. Then what? Well, there are still some things that we can consider. And the next thing that comes to mind is a cooling vest. So a cooling vest is what it sounds like. It's like a fishing vest where there are cold packs and they're against your body or against your clothes, and they help cool your core body temperature. Nicole asks, SPMS here, experiencing episodes where I do not understand language, lasts only a couple of minutes per episode. Is this a common MS symptom? It's new for me in the past couple of months. Nicole, that is not a common MS symptom. That symptom is called aphasia where you have trouble with language. More specifically, it's a receptive aphasia. You're having difficulty interpreting language that you're hearing. And that is not a very common symptom in MS. The way that you describe the fact that it occurs for a couple of minutes then goes away makes me concerned about some other neurological process, either like a TIA, like a mini stroke, affecting the center of your brain involved in language, or possibly a seizure. Either way, this is something that you absolutely need to bring to the attention of your provider, and I certainly hope that you do that right away. I had a blast on our last live stream. Shout out to all the folks from around the globe that jumped on to hang out and up their game and talk about MS. My name's Aaron Boster, and thank you for learning about MS with me. Until my next video or my next live stream, or the next time I see you at the Boster Center for MS, be safe and take care.